an epic story with a really compelling character at the centre of it. So you follow both the journey of this one man and also the journey of a country. But in this year, as we await the Chilcot inquiry, it comes back round again to being a play about why Britain goes to war, uh, who we trust to take us to war, and what the consequences of that are. Obviously, one of the things that caught the headlines was that Henry V was going to be played by a woman. Uh, Michelle Terry is, is one of our finest, most imaginative, most emotionally truthful Shakespearean actors. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand at tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. Um, it's interesting, what happened when we got into rehearsal was we realised really quickly how little, uh, how small a part gender was going to play in this interpretation. Actually, it's not a play that has um, a romantic heart. It's not a play that, uh, in which relationships between men and women come to the fore. So actually, it's only right at the very end of the play that Henry's gender becomes relevant to the action of the play when Henry woos the princess. For the majority of the play, actually, it's really about what it means to be a leader, what it means to be uh, a monarch, what it means to be uh, a captain, what it means to have the responsibility for taking the lives of soldiers into battle and, and potentially losing them. When we that shall be remembered, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Having Michelle at the heart of the play meant that actually the gender of a lot of the other characters was up for grabs. So we genuinely gender-blind cast this play, particularly in, in the case of Princess Catherine, we auditioned men and women for the role, and the actor that we chose in the end happened to be a boy, and that has led to all sorts of discoveries about what a scene that is often played very much for comedy in a sort of... Um, uh, Henry is this kind of bumbly Hugh Grant can't can, can lead a, a, an army into battle but can't articulate his feelings for a woman. Actually, it becomes a much more uh, politically urgent, politically articulate scene about what it means to treat uh, a woman as a political pawn. So this is a play in which uh, a chorus comes on stage at the beginning and says... Um, you're going to have to use your imaginations because we don't really have horses, we don't really have armies, they're not really kings. So we just use what we've got to tell the story and your imagination has to fill in the gaps. So we wanted to envelop the audience in an experience that's going to really charge their imaginations. We have this extraordinary young choreographer called John Ross. I became captivated by his work when I saw a piece that he'd made about uh, soldiers in Afghanistan and what it was, what it was like to experience being in a battle. And that's what, that's the feeling that we wanted to have in this production. So it's it's less about splitting the cast in half and giving one side French flags and one side British flags, and more about creating a sense of what it what it's like to be in the mud and the blood and the fury of the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, I think what we've seen in this year, which has been packed full of Shakespeare, even more so than most years in this 400th anniversary of his death, is that, is that audiences are not only hungry for to see those stories told, but they're also hungry to see those stories reinvented and retold. And the reason why Shakespeare has survived 400 years uh, is because those stories can be continually retold, find new ways to provoke, to inspire, to question the world that we live in today.